And as they do, I want to again have us welcome Rick Harrison, who has spoken here many a time and is part of our church beyond the South Bay. Rick is going to come and bring our message as we complete our living sacrifice uh, two-week messages on what it means to be a living sacrifice. Let's welcome Rick to our ministry. Well, good morning. It's uh, good to be back and uh, be with you again. I, uh, you know, your music program rocks. <laughs> it's so fun to hear Peter and sing. He's got a great, great voice, and the songs are, are Christ-centered and worshipful. And the bell choir, I want to come back next time and have them do the Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> Don't you think that'd just be awesome? They'd be, they'd just just going like nuts. Choir was great this morning. Um, I, I think music is a part of our, how we were created. It's a way to express ourselves, and I'm, I'm appreciative of the way you in this congregation value that, and you do a great job with it. You know, uh, um, getting older isn't always more fun. I find that uh, I make a lot more trips to the doctor than I used to. And uh, recently I went and I got diagnosed with OMD. And the uh, doctor said that uh, I ought to be using all of my time, you know, to uh, enjoy myself because this is probably going to be the thing that kills me. I was sharing this with some friends and they said, uh, we aren't really sure what OMD is, Rick. What, what is that? And I said, it's old man disease. Um, <laughs> Mark is suffering from it as well. <laughs> Except he died three years ago and doesn't know it. <laughs> uh, I love my brother Mark. And um, it's not even fun to make fun of him anymore. <laughs> but uh, life is good. Life is really good. And... God has made up for so many things um, that, that fill voids, in, in, certainly in my life, and my wife's life. As we are watching God do things that are just way beyond our wildest imaginations. And I have a wild imagination. And so it, it just gives me chills, chills. When God moves in such powerful and convicting ways. Um, a while back, we were praying uh, at one of the, uh, at Rancho La Sherpa for, for a powerful influence uh, to help us politically. And about 10 days later, um, I was up to meet a lady who is a potential donor at the camp, and in she drives, and out of the car she comes, and then behind her are two big limousines. And they pull into the driveway of the camp, and out come these great big burly guys. You know, I mean, they, and they, they, they were not funny looking. They were very serious looking. We wondered what, the, what, what was going on, you know, I mean, did... Does this donor, I mean, is she that big? She needs bodyguards. <laughs> and and uh, then following those great big burly guys, out come the mayor of Los Angeles and the district attorney of Los Angeles. And they didn't even know why they were there. They said, what is this place? Our donor was having lunch with them, picked them up early and brought them up to us just 10 days before we had prayed for a powerful influence. We had the attention of the, of the district attorney of Los Angeles and the mayor of Los Angeles for three and a half hours on our property. Does God work? Amen. God works powerfully when we pray and we let God do the things that he wants to do. You know, in, in life, not everything is the way that we think it is. Sometimes we look at something 
Uh, this happens all the time with my wife. I, I'll, I'll swear I put the keys right there. I know. I've seen it in my mind. I put the key there. I say, honey, I put the key right there. And then she'll go, well, let's see if it's in your pocket. And there it is. It's in my pocket. But I swear it was, I put that on that counter. Sometimes what we see is not necessarily always the truth. Sometimes there's things hidden in there that we don't see. Now, I'm hoping to have a little help with the visual department. Are we good up there? All right, we're gonna, I'm going to show you an image, and I'm going to ask you to look at this image, and what do you see? What's the first thing you see? You see a cup? How many people see a cup or a, a pedestal? How many people see faces? Yeah, look at that. Can, did you see both of them at the same time, or did you see one first? You saw one first? If you, if you can't see the faces, then you are not filled with the Spirit, and you need to leave now. <laughs> now, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah you see it now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> There, if you focus on the white of, the, of it, you'll see the two faces facing each other. You know? and, and then most people see the, the pedestal. You know, that, that's the very first thing they see. And that's, that's a very psychological because the pedestal is in the middle of the picture and your eyes tend to work from the outside in and you make your assessments as you go in. But the white there, the white space, are the two faces. Okay, the next one's a little bit harder. I want you to look at this next one for me. Uh, tell me what you see. You see an old man? There is no old man in there. It's an old woman, maybe. But, <laughs> but it could be an old man. How many see, people see a young lady? You see a young lady. How many people see an old lady? Do you, all right, you got to look at it a little harder. You got to look at it. It's an Armenian lady. She's got a big nose. Mark, Mark brought that up in the first service. Do you see both of them? Sometimes you have to change your perspective just a little bit to be able to see the second image that is there. Okay. If you, if, if you want to look at this, I'll, it'll blow your mind later. <laughs> Actually, there's uh, Nick Jagger is in that picture as well, but I won't tell you about that. Um, sometimes our perspective of life we have to have some sort of an enlightenment where we can look at something and see all the things that are there. And when we can't see all the things that are there, we make wrong assessments or we make wrong assumptions. Um, about uh, 11 years ago, I was walk working for another uh, conference center, and uh, the camp was going through some pretty major changes. The church was changing. Um, the culture around us was changing. And I kept telling the board that life is changing and finally they bought into it and they said all right if your culture is changing then then we need a new vision we need we need what what's the new vision and I said that's right you know but I had spent so much energy trying to get them to say we need a new vision but I didn't have a new vision I didn't know what the answer was and so I said okay finally I get a chance to to do this and so I I I worked on it I went on retreats I stayed in some of my the board members had cabins and I would go up there and spend a week and I ground and grind it out trying to figure out what is this new vision and I could not think of anything that would really really work and so a very wise person on my board told me he says you know what Rick sometimes you just you know it's like writer's lock you know you just gotta gotta somehow get some help you know like Rick you need a lot of help and so, so I went and hired this guy by the name of Brian Wallace. Brian Wallace at the time uh, was about 32 years old. And he was a consultant. And um, I was very impressed with his resume. He was a consultant for Sun uh, Microsystems and had gone in and done a complete management overhaul. And I really liked this guy. I thought he was creative. I thought he was innovative. And so he met with me. Uh, for about two hours each week trying to help me create a new vision. Except he told me from the very beginning, Rick, I'm not going to tell you the vision. The vision has to come from you. But I will help you get there. 
And so for about the first six weeks, all I did, he, he just asked questions, and all I did was tell him why it won't work. And what I thought we really needed was what we didn't have. So on the, I believe it was on the seventh time we met, he, he brought a pad of paper, uh, a yellow pad with about 100 sheets of paper, uh, pages on it. Threw it on the table. He says, this is going to be a short session. I'm just going to give you this and tell you what to do, and then we're going to go. And uh, I said, what do you want me to do with this? And he says, I want you to fill out on this single line, 100 pages, um, everything that your company has. Everything. So... I can do that. So I started filling out single line, filled up 100 pages of stuff that we had. Gave it back to him the next day, the next time we met, and he goes, oh, man, this is nowhere near complete. Go go at it again. So I went at it again. This went on for four weeks, me filling these things out. And and then on 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 the fifth one, he looked at all of the things I had, and I didn't duplicate anything, and he goes, you know, you, have, you don't have anything about your staff. So you don't value your staff and in, in the, in the people that are a part of your organization? You just wrote things on here. And I, oh my God, I forgot about the people. You know, so then I went back and did it again. But in that time, between those, those, that, that lesson, all of a sudden, there was a revelation. All of a sudden, it was like I saw the second picture. You know, I saw it in the midst of, of, of the first image. I began to see that second image. And I came into him, and I took my pad, and I threw it on the table, and it was nothing on it, nothing on it. And he goes, what, you didn't have time to write? <laughs> I said, no, I know what you're doing. I know, I know what you're doing. And he goes, what am I doing? And I said, I am rich. You got it. You got it. Until that happened, all I could think about was what I didn't have. By filling out hundreds of lines of everything that I got, somewhere in that process, I woke up and I realized that I was not poor. I was filthy rich. I had 350 acres covered in redwood trees. I had a staff of about 100 people that were amazing. I had everything that I could possibly need. IT people, HR people. I had all the staff I needed to do it. All I could think about until that moment is what I didn't have. And when you obsess on what you don't have, then you are a sorry person. And it is a state of mind that we find ourselves in so often. But I was rich. I was wealthy. I had more than anybody else had. I had all kinds of resources that were at my disposal. I just didn't see them. You know, the same thing happened when I came down here. The uh, Senate of Southern California gave... PCCI, the corporation in which I'm the president, they gave us three properties. Do you know what those properties are valued at? At the time that they were given to us, and we hold the deed to those properties, $22 million. And all I heard from everybody that was around me is, oh man, you're never going to be able to do anything with that. And I'm thinking, <laughs> What's wrong with you? If somebody walks up to you and says, could you do ministry with $22 million worth of property? Are you going to say, God, I am, I hate this. No, you look at the possibilities. You're going, I'm wealthy. I am stinking rich. Do you know what I could do with this kind of property? Instead of, oh my gosh, I've been burdened. Do you know what? You are stinking rich. You are filthy rich. You are wealthy people. Do you know why I know this? Because statistics, I went into my computer and my computer said so, <laughs> first of all. But 
we in the United States, if you have an average salary in the United States, you are in the one percentile of the richest people in the world. And you know, when I plugged in, it also had a line there. It said, plug in your city or zip code, and the average wage for that place will come up, and it will tell you where you stand. Do you want to know where you guys stand in the average wage in Redondo Beaches? You stand at 03 not even 1%, 0.3% of the wealthiest people in the world. How many people know how wealthy you are? You know, there are two kinds of rich people. There's a, per, there's a rich person who knows they're rich, and those are rare, and they're, prob- they're so rich that they don't have to worry about it. And so they just, yeah, I'm rich, you know. And then there's a whole slew of people like us, me included, that are wealthy, but we don't know it. Just like I was at the conference center. All I could think about is what I don't have instead of what I do have. And there is a big, big difference in our lifestyles when we can figure that small thing out. Do you know that our poorest college students, the poorest of the poor, the ones that are going into debt, the ones that, that have no money, and they will be the first to tell you, man, I tell you, I'm living on, I'm living on a dime. I'm, I'm right there. Poorest college students, they are within the three percentile of the richest people in the world. Do you know that the homeless people that are walking the streets of Redondo Beach, the homeless, they are in the 15th percentile of the richest people on the face of the earth. Who do you compare yourself with? You know, there's, there's a couple of things that... that that really kill us in this. And uh, one of them is, is the TV. The t- we watch the TV, and the TV tells us all the time of what we should have. And we deserve that. We deserve to drive an $80,000 Mercedes. Gosh, I mean, how, I, I saw two of them on the way here. Everybody's got to have them. And so we want one because somebody else has it. But let me, let me pose this to you. When is enough enough? You know, there's always going to be somebody wealthier than you. The other thing that's going to get us and trip us up, and you guys are right smack dab in the middle of it, is that you live in a wealthy part of the country. And there's an awful lot of people that have stuff that maybe you don't have. But you want it. And so we think, if I can't have everything that I want or what my neighbor's got, man, he just bought a new great big old Winnebago, a $180,000 vehicle. I should have one. That doesn't mean that you aren't rich. It just means that he's probably wealthier than you are. He's in that one-tenth of one percent. So... When we understand, when we compare ourselves to our neighbors in a wealthy neighborhood, we aren't going to stand up real well. There's some of us that are going to do better than others, and there's some in the church that, can, can, that have more than others. But in the end, there's always, always going to be somebody that has more than you do. And so we begin to think that, wow, I don't have anything if I don't have at least what that person has. My wife and I were, um, this is a number of years ago, way back, um, uh, we, I was looking for a church to uh, be a youth director in. Actually, I was ordained, but I was searching around for a place to go, and I had three churches that were very interested in me, and they solicited my name uh, to uh, apply for their jobs. 
And I want you to hear the three churches. Okay? And by the way, I want you to know, one of them offered me a job. The other two just solicited me to, you know, and we kind of ended the relationship before it got too far. Um, Malibu Press, Santa Inez Presbyterian Church, and Carmel. What do all three of those churches have in common? Very, very wealthy areas. Incredibly wealthy. When I drive into the parking lot to meet the youth group, there was a whole parking lot filled with Porsches and Mercedes and BMWs. And these, I was driving a 1962 BMW, a VW bug that was held together with Bondo. That's, that was what Jenny and I, in fact, it didn't even have a gas gauge. We had to get out of the car and do a dip thing, you know, to see if there was any gas in there. And if we wanted to turn the heater on, I had to get out and go all underneath the car and put the flap up and put the nail back in. That's how we got heat in the car. That's what we were driving. And if I went to work in Carmel and the kids are all driving these other kind of cars and they're going to Hawaii for the weekend with their parents because that's their third home over there, Guess what I'm going to want? I'm going to be sitting at the bottom end of the, of the, the financial scale here, and I'm going to want all of these things that are going to be way out of reach for me. And so, my wife and I, in our infinite wisdom, mostly my wife's wisdom, because um, I kept thinking, maybe they would just give us a car. <laughs> We chose to go to a small town uh, in Northern California called Corning. Corning doesn't have anything to do with Corning Ware. It's the olive capital of the world. It's just off of I-5, just south of Redding, in the middle of nowhere. There were about 4,000 people in the town. And when I got there, I was the only person who had a computer. In, in the entire town. In fact, I think I was the only person who even knew what a computer was in <laughs> the entire town. But these people were right in my economic ballpark. <laughs> my VW was cool there. <laughs> and, and I tell you, it, it felt good. We had no money to go out on a, on a date night or take the kids out. Our big thing is we'd go down to 7-Eleven and buy 25-cent chili dogs at 7-Eleven. And that was a treat. You know, we had no money, but we were happy. How many people have been to Mexico or a third world country and seen happy kids playing in the street? They don't have a whole lot, but man, they, they're, they're okay. We started, I was instrumental in starting an orphanage in, um, in Mexicali. Um, some of you know that I like to ride motorcycle. I have a great big 1600 Kawasaki and and, uh, you know, I, um, we call ourselves um, heaven's devils. Um, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> laugh louder. No, I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> but we, uh, I got involved with writing with these guys, and, and they, 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 they drink a little too much, and they're a little bit rowdy. But um, they're basically good people. The hardest part is that when we go to stop at a restaurant or something, all the wives gather around me at the table and they all want to know how to fix their husbands. <laughs> and all the guys are sitting at the other table looking at me like, what's he saying? You know, but anyway, they want, I told them some of the stuff that we're doing in ministry, and they wanted to do something. And so they, t they do once a month. They go around to all the Goodwill stores and take all the clothes that Goodwill can't get rid of, and they gather it all up, put it in a U-Haul truck, and they haul it down to Mexicali. And then several of us who have, are able to cross the border and, and, and get back across, <laughs> we, we take it in and we start an orphanage. We hired three women. They have a, a, like a, a used clothing store there. And we started off with two kids. that you, She just took them off the street. And now there's 12 kids that they're supporting in that, in that orphanage down there. It's amazing. You don't need a whole lot to start an orphanage down there. But the point is, is that I, we watched, even with a little bit, these kids were so thankful and so appreciative. And I think, man, how much, how much clothes do we have in our closet? How many sh pairs of shoes do we have? 
um, you, know, how, you know, we've got computer phones, we've got expensive cameras, we've got laptops, we've got tablets, we've got TVs, high definition. We, we have so much. We have so much. We are rich. We are wealthy. We can afford to put gas in our car. There's another side thing I want to just share with you briefly. It's going to be a little bit out of context, but in, in Scripture, there's, a, there's a, a difference between individualism and corporate concepts of, of, of a body. In, in the Old Testament, we, hear, we see God dealing with Israel as a corporate body of people. Um, and, and even in the New Testament, we see Jesus... Uh, relating to us um, corporately as his children. Now, this is a fact, and it is true, what I'm going to say, so don't, don't take this out of context. Yes, Jesus died for you. He did die for you. But he didn't just die for you. He died for all of humanity. He died for all of us. Corporately, he died. One of the things that we do in this world is that we take our own individualism and our own rights, and it's all about us. It's about how I interact. And there's, there's another way to do it. You are a part of a bigger picture here, my friends. You are a part of something much larger than you. Yes, you are an individual, and you need to buy in. But when you buy in, you are a part of something huge. You are a part of God's plan to do amazing things. It's not about just you. God is not your buddy. And I can say that with a fact because there was a time when I thought God was my buddy. But God is not your buddy. God is God. <laughs> and when I bring God down to being my buddy, God is no longer God anymore. God needs to be respected. God needs to be honored. God needs to be praised. God needs to be feared. Our God is not our buddy. But we are his children. We are his body. You know, talking about rich, there was, uh, there was about five guys that had in, in, a, in a locker room by the way you never want a story about five guys in a locker room that's not a good way to start but this story does um, five guys in the locker room and they were done playing racquetball they came out and were getting changed and there was a duffel bag and all of a sudden a, a phone went off in the duffel bag and uh, it rang about three four times and everybody's kind of looking at each other like you know whose phone you know finally Guy walks over there, he reaches in the duffel bag, and he presses it, and he presses the speaker phone on the, on the phone, and he goes, hello? And on the other end, it says, oh, hi, honey, is that you? And, he, and the guy says, yeah. He says, oh, well, I just wanted to, to call you and uh, let you know that uh, I am down here at this such such a store, and um, there is a coat here that is absolutely fabulous. I mean, it is unbelievable. Problem is, it's $900. I don't know. What, what do you think I ought to do? And he said, well, I don't know. I, do you like it? Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, I think you ought to have it then. Go ahead. Go ahead. And, you know, if you, if you like it, I want you to be happy. He says, wow, you're in a good mood. You know, and then he says, well, since you're in a good mood, do you know that that new Mercedes, that red one that we wanted, that we were looking at, that I like, guess what? It's in. It's in the store right now. Should I go by and get it? How much did they want for it? She gives him some number. He says, well, listen, make sure you get all the options, okay? Get all the options. If we're going to drive a car like that, make sure you get all the options. Then he says, well, gosh, man, I might as well go for broke here. Honey, you know that house up there next to PV Country Club? That one we were looking at, 3,000 square foot, had the pool and the views of the, of the 
of the fairway, all that. Yeah, guess what? It's for sale. We can have it if we want it. Oh, what the heck. I'm all in. Let's do it. He says, okay. Hangs up, drops the phone back in the duffel bag. And all the other guys around were like, looking at him. Wow, you must be doing okay. He goes, why do you say that? Well, you just, you know, spent an awful lot of money. And he goes, I'm not doing okay. I just got laid off. That wasn't my phone. <laughs> Boy, that guy's going to be surprised when he gets home. Jesus gives us an example of giving that comes out of richness. That richness is, is you know, we, we can look at the church and the history of the church and we can look at wonderful people that have given a tremendous amount of money to, to serve the greater purpose of God's church. But Jesus should be our example in this. And, and I, in closing, I just want you to know that, that Jesus, who was very, very rich, Jesus had it all. He was a creator. Everything on earth belonged to Jesus. There was no poor in Jesus. Jesus was the thing. There was nobody that was going to top Jesus. And Jesus, in the incarnation, which is a fancy way for saying when Jesus, who was God, became man, Jesus went from being rich, unchallenged wealth, to being poor. Look at where he's born. He was born in, a, in, a, in basically a stable outside. His parents didn't have a whole lot. In fact, I challenge you to look through Scripture and find out, is there anywhere in Scripture where it talks about Jesus owning anything? It talks about people lending him stuff, but it doesn't really talk about him ever owning very much. Did he ever have his own house? Did he ever have his own boat? I, I, I really wonder, did Jesus, you know, did he have his own robe and sandals? Were those the things that he owned? Because he went through all through life. And then in the end, 33 years after his birth, he, he has his robe is about the only thing that they roll dice for. That is all that he owned on this earth. Jesus, the wealthiest person, the richest person, the last person that would ever be challenged was rich and he became poor. Why? Because he loved you. And he showed you grace. You know what the definition of grace is? It's love in action. It's your unworthiness and God's willing to act on your behalf. It isn't your worthiness is where you get saved. It is your unworthiness that motivated Jesus to die for you. This is where the miracles happen. Jesus gave it all. Now, Jesus isn't asking you to do that, I don't think, is to go and die on the cross for somebody. But I would really challenge you to think and to understand that you are some of the wealthiest people on the face of this earth. And you are asked to share some of that for the greater good of your community. This church has a plan for that. This church is meeting some of the needs of the poor. This church is taking care of the widows and the orphans. This church is reaching out, not for its own good and hoping that these people bring in money, but to serve the greater body of believers. And that is why we motivated out of our love for the greater good, not our good, but the greater good. We participate in sharing of our wealth. That's my challenge. At least go away and think about it. Think about, I am rich. 
you are richer than maybe you ever know let's pray heavenly father thank you we we are rich in you and the spirit we are rich because you love us we have so much to be thankful for and lord you also have blessed us to live where we live and we 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 just thrive in this abundance and we are thankful lord we are so very thankful at this time of year we just lift this up to you and say lord what have we done to deserve this and i know that there are some here that that think they don't have anything lord may you show them what they do have and and rather than what they don't have and open eyes that may we rejoice in our abundance in your name we pray